Good armies protect their civilians. Moral people protect their civilians. People like Hamas, they, 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 they put their civilians in harm's way. That's not, that's not a moral failing of Israel. It's a moral failing of Hamas. Do you have someone in your life that will pick up the phone no matter what? Someone that will drop everything and help you in a time of need? I know it's, it's hard. Think about it. Hard to imagine that your best friend or someone that you trust in your family would see that you're calling with a, you know, a 911 emergency and then just ignore you or turn on you. I mean, imagine what that feels like. It would feel like someone kicked you in the gut, right? It would just feel like you lost your breath. Well, think about Israel now. That used to be the relationship between Israel and America when America would need Israel, Israel would be right there. When Israel needed America, America would be right there. In 1948, America was the first country to recognize the state of Israel and has been supportive of the Jewish state in the Middle East ever since. I mean, this has been our main line. And I was in Mar-a-Lago this past week. I was with the president. We were there for Border 911 for our gala event. It was amazing. Uh, everybody at Mar-a-Lago was incredible, but I remember talking to folks there and talking about how Israel really is the front line for the United States in the Middle East. I don't know if you're young or older, but everybody remembers 9-11, even if you didn't actually witness it. Everybody remembers that. If I say 9-11, people usually know what I mean by 9-11. And I want you to think about how few people, it was like 19, if I'm right, 19 terrorists involved in target, just 19 people changed the trajectory of our nation and put us into the longest war of American history. Think about that. 19 people. Israel, when we were targeted, was the first nation to be like, I totally understand how you feel. We are by your side. We will work with you to find out who did this and why. And now it feels as though the Biden administration has turned its back on Israel. We've forged these strong relationships. They mean something. Whether it's trade, tourism, economics, defense, intelligence, innovation. And I mean, research and development between Israel and the United States is huge. Competition as well. Competition as well. Just months before President Joe Biden's inauguration, President Trump had signed the historic Abraham Accords. I have had Arye Lightstone on the show. He was part of that. I have Ambassador David Friedman today. Here, right here is Arye Lightstone's book. I, I had it right here. Let my people know the incredible story of Middle East peace and what lies ahead. And I'm throwing that out there because Arye worked very closely with Ambassador David Friedman. This was a very, very important project. The Abraham Accords was so important. It was the closest we've ever come. We've normalized the relationship between Israel and other Middle Eastern nations like Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Sudan, Jordan. The first time that there felt like, wow, maybe we have a chance here. And now everything has changed. Emboldened by President Biden's weakness in the departure from Afghanistan. And I got to tell you, that was probably the biggest mistake. It resonated throughout the globe. As soon as Biden turned over Kabul to those terrorists, as soon as Biden turned over all of our military assets that we left behind, over $83 billion worth of equipment. It sent a message across the globe and caused a domino effect that basically put all of our lives in danger. It emboldened Vladimir Putin. It emboldened North Korea. 
It emboldened Iran and the Ayatollah. It emboldened all of our enemies. China, everyone saw the weakness of, of this administration. And by the way, so many of us asleep at the wheel, so many of us just silent, not speaking up, not getting involved in politics, remaining silent. I don't want to offend anybody. Remember the silent majority. What the heck is that? Silent majority. Silent majority only counts if you speak up and stand up eventually and say no more. Then you could say, oh, there was a silent majority. They all spoke up. But you can't remain a silent majority and expect anything good to happen. You have to stand up. President Trump is in his 70s. I saw him this past weekend. I spoke with him and he is amazing. He is fighting for this nation, fighting for this nation. What are we doing? Instead of standing up for our allies and their fight against terror, the Biden administration. And by the way, there are many people on the right and on the left and in the media who are the same way. They have been hypercritical of Israel. Hypercritical of all of Israel's partners, hypercritical of Israel's uh, attack against Hamas and fight and war against these terrorist organizations. They have been selling our ally out, selling our greatest ally out. And by the way, let me remind you, when you do this, you're going to sell us out as well. You need to listen to people that know what they are talking about. People who have been in the Middle East. I've, I've covered this war. My husband fought in the war against terrorism. The Iranian regime is a cult-like regime that is willing to do whatever it takes to own that whole Middle East, that whole Fertile Crescent. They do not care. They want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And guess who's next? Us. If Israel's the little Satan, like they say, then we are the great Satan. And the great Satan is what they are targeting, folks. That is you and me and our families and our way of life and our Western way of life. And believe me, they are willing to use any proxy organization to do that. I have Ambassador David Friedman on the show today, and we're going to break this all down for you. Folks, you don't want to go anywhere. Hey, are you concerned about the endless flood of illegal immigration at the southern border? How about the trillion dollars being added to the national debt every 100 days? It's no wonder thousands of hardworking patriotic Americans, including myself, are learning how to protect and diversify their retirement savings with precious metals. That's why I've partnered with the top rated Gold Co. Listen to their current offer. Get a free 2024 wealth protection kit and learn how to possibly get $10,000 in bonus silver as a listener of the Sarah Carter Show while supplies last. Protect your family's financial future and freedom. Get started today at Sarah, S A R A, likesgold.com or call 855 823 G O L D. Get your free gold kit from Gold Co. and learn how to get $10,000 in bonus silver. Sarah, S A R A, likesgold.com or 855 823 4653. That's Sarah, likesgold.com or call 855 823 G O L D. D. Very happy to have Ambassador David Friedman on the Sarah Carter show with us today. I think this is so important. I try to keep my focus on Israel, Ambassador, at all times, and mainly because I believe our relationship is just that important. You and I were recently in Israel together not too long ago, and so I want to thank you for first for being on the show. Well, it's my pleasure uh, to be with you, Sarah, and it was great being with you in Israel and uh Thank you for uh, thank you for all you do in the media. It's so important. We have so few platforms that really give good, straight, unbiased uh, information. And so at a time, especially like this, it's really necessary and much appreciated. Why do you think that is, Ambassador? Uh, why do you think there has been such an open, I personally, I, I would call it 
anti-Semitic, anti-Israel sentiment across U.S. media platforms, considering what happened on October 7th? So I think I think, you know, it's 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 a really complicated question. And there are probably lots of answers, you know, ranging from, um, you know, there's there there's a darkness in the hearts of a lot of people. Uh, I mean, anti-Semitism has been around for thousands of years and, you know, we're not going to we're not going to end it any more than anyone else in the past has been able to end it. But, um, you know, there obviously are um, accelerants, if you will, that that make it worse now. Um, I, I think the worst is the fact that, you know, we're living in this kind of post-truth society where people can get out messaging uh, to a very wide audience, you know, with a lot of credibility, even if it's completely false. So, for example, you know, something like TikTok, right, which uh, I happen not to know much about. I don't use TikTok, but what I understand is that, you know, the, the content on TikTok is like more than 100 to 1 against Israel. Uh, now, you know, I, I know that, you know, while, while we can make arguments uh, critical of Israel, there's, there's no way that the merits uh, justify a hundred to one ratio of, uh, of negative content to positive. Um, you have, um, uh, you know, for some reason, um, uh, you know, we, we live in this society now where the assumption is that if you're weak, uh, you're moral. I mean, this is, this is just, you know, a, uh, a kind of an odd thing. You know, we have a, a, a segment of society that reflexively just stands with people who are, perceived uh, to be disadvantaged. Now, I don't think I don't think Palestinians should be perceived to be disadvantaged. They've got lots of allies. They've got lots of money. They've had lots of opportunities to make peace. They've had lots of opportunities to build better lives for themselves. But for some reason, you know, they've been able to uh, occupy this 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 part of the narrative that they're that they're somehow disadvantaged. And, you know, we live in this world now where, you know, if you're poor, the assumption, you know, you have a poor person and a rich person. The assumption is that the poor person was robbed and the rich person stole the money. You know, it's everything is based on identity and, you know, there's no no real substance to the analysis. And, you know, so there's a lot of that. Um, you know, I think that some of these um, progressive movements like, you know, defund the police and Black Lives Matter, I think, you know, they were they were looking for some energy to make their movements um, vibrant again. And I think um, they kind of uh, aligned with this, uh, with this group of, uh, of crazy uh, Israel haters to, uh, you know, to create a force multiplier. Um, it, there, there's just lots and lots of reasons. And of course, you know, there, you know, you can, you can take a picture, uh, one picture of one dead child, right? Which unfortunately in a war, any war, uh, every war, there are dead children. You take a picture of one dead child, you post it on the, on the uh, internet and people assume it's reflective of a much broader uh, amount of uh, carnage, and, and and that you know creates uh, hatred. So it's it's all it's, it's just a whole bunch of reasons. Um, uh, Anti-Semitism is is very much in the in the water uh, uh, that people drink. You know, it's out there, but it's so many factors have kind of multiplied and accelerated that now more than ever before. Let me ask you this: Do you think Iran? And I've and this is. This is what I've talked to U.S. intelligence about and others in the region who have worked that region prepared for a propaganda campaign against Israel, even as they utilize proxies like Hamas to target the kibbutz, to target Israel, which I believe is they engaged in a full war against Israel, but that they had prepared for this in a sense like let's push all this propaganda against Israel the minute after the attack and let's turn the tide that they actually utilized social media and their allies throughout the media industry to kind of turn the tide against Israel. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I think that was the um, that was maybe the core of their strategy, right? Their strategy wasn't was never military because they know that Israel uh, Israel has massive military advantage over Hamas. That Hamas is never going to defeat Israel in a conventional battle. But uh, the idea is let Hamas do as much damage as possible and then hide behind their civilians accompanied by this massive blitz of social media that places Hamas as the oppressed victim. And, and you know, uh, it, they made one mistake, which is they started the campaign too soon. 
right? If they had right. started the campaign three weeks later after Israel had already gone into Gaza and, and had engaged, okay, you know, you know, maybe, you know, unlikely, but maybe it was a response to Israel's um, engagement. But they started like on October 8th. Right. So, you know, they were celebrating Hamas before Israel went into three weeks before Israel went into Gaza, before a single, uh, you know, a single bomb was dropped in Gaza, before a single airplane flew over Gaza, before a single soldier went into Gaza. So they were already um, glorifying Hamas before there was anything to complain about on the Israeli side. So clearly it was a very well orchestrated uh, campaign. Um, and look, I mean, we got to get better at it. We got to we got we got to get better at, at, at fighting it. Um, uh, I think they've they've gotten the better of us on uh, on this social media campaign. Well, I've always said that, you know, recently we've seen the rise of anti-Semitism in the United States. We've seen it in, you know, Dearborn, Michigan, in areas where I think Islamism has uh, taken a stronghold. And that's pretty frightening. Um, and now, you know, watching what's happening throughout the world, and particularly what we're seeing Iran now making overt threats against Israel. And we'll go into that in a minute. But you were the first really political appointee. And I think Arya Lightstone, he brought this up in his book, uh, first political appointee under President Trump to be put as ambassador into Israel. And you, you know, you're knowledge of the region is so vast and part of the Abraham Accords, you know, you were, you were one of the fathers of the Abraham Accords. How are you seeing that now with the Biden administration? What looking back, I mean, do you feel that this administration is destroying everything that you attempted to build under president Trump and how long will it take to rebuild all of that again? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they're messing it all up, uh, from start to finish, um, look, they they um, destroyed America's credibility generally, which is always kind of the, the key ingredient to any advancements in the Middle East. Because people, you know, in the Middle East is very different than America. You can't you can't talk your way into peace. You can't talk your way into um, normalization. You have to you have to demonstrate that you know you bring to the table a certain strength. A strength, both both a physical strength and a and a and a sense of conviction, where people trust you, and you know, in some respects, they fear you. And um, you know, from the day we left Afghanistan, that was just out the window completely. So people, I don't think people understand how the withdrawal from Afghanistan set the stage for everything that went wrong uh, after that in terms of foreign policy, from you know the the, the Russian attack on uh, Ukraine. To um, to Hamas in Iran and Hezbollah attacking uh, Israel, to the threats China's making against Taiwan. I mean, it's just all of it started there. Um, look, you know, we're we're not respected, we're not feared, we're not considered particularly intelligent. We play all sides of an issue, uh, in in particular when it comes to you know Hamas's attack against Israel. You have the Biden administration. You know, just trying to, to 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 thread an impossible needle, which is to, on the one hand, show support to Israel for their voters who who care about Israel, which is unfortunately an increasingly smaller uh, size in the Democratic Party, and then to 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 placate you know these uh, these these crazy people in Dearborn, Michigan, who not only you know hate Israel, you know, I mean the they were screaming they were screaming death to America at their rally this week as well, not just death to Israel. So we can actually play a clip of that. Can we do that, Cal? Can we play a clip of that so that the ambassador can respond to that clip? I think it's important. Imam Khomeini recognized that Israel is an evil settler colonialist project. He realized it is a cancer and he established this day. Israel before this, brothers and sisters, was a sacred cow. Nobody could criticize Israel. Everybody was terrified of being anti-Semitic. Everybody was afraid of them. But now the people of conscience very openly will criticize Israel. They recognize Israel for what it is. Israel is ISIS. Israel are, they are Nazis. They are fascists. They are racist. The people of the world now know this. How do you even respond to that? Well, um, look, people like that have been around for generations. And, you know, most of the time, with some very unfortunate exceptions, they get 
relegated to the scrap heap of history. But this guy, I have no idea who he is, but this guy now is making common cause with um, with you know political leaders in the United States. You know, from uh, you know Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib to um, I hate to say it, but you know uh, people like Chuck Schumer and 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 Nancy Pelosi who are uh, turning on Israel. And um, it's 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 politics. What's what's happened here is the Democrats have allowed you know short term political needs to overwhelm you know core principles that we thought we thought they held. I mean, I've you know I've I've been in Israel you know with uh, with Pelosi. Uh, I've heard her you know speak about you know her core values of supporting Israel. Well, you know things are getting tough, and you know. The politics are getting tough, and all of a sudden, you know, it's time to start conditioning aid. Maybe we need to re- really rethink that alliance. And you know, they're 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 blaming Netanyahu as if you know, as if nine million Israelis should be um, should be you know should should face this incredible existential risk because they don't like the politics of their elected leader. I mean, it's it's re- it's really hard to take. I mean, I'm you know, I'm 65 years old. This is I've been involved in this space since as I can remember, I've never seen the politics in America this bad. And and the one thing that if you, if you would have played that tape for a, a longer period of time, you would have heard these people shouting death to America. So let's just, you know, th- those people, people who want to make common cause with that lunatic, with that anti-Semite, people who want to make common cause, understand they're making common cause with somebody that wants to destroy America as well. That's that's very interesting because it is exactly what I think every time I hear one of these radicals get up there and speak and I see more and more people in places like Dearborn that support them when I was in Pakistan and I remember talking to the you know covering the war in Afghanistan and I remember talking to sources inside Pakistan that said you know hey it was our government that made nice with uh, you know, uh, the Haqqanis. And then as soon as, uh, you know, they, they put the kibosh on, on the Haqqani network, the Haqqanis turned on them and basically targeted the government schools and the government leadership. So sometimes you have a tiger, for example, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, or even Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi thinking that they're placating these radicals and these extremists. Well, these extremists, just like you said, Ambassador, are going to turn on them. They're not going to escape the wrath of these extremists, just like America won't if we tolerate it. And, 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 and you know, the, the, the logic behind it, I mean, the, the attempt to say this is not political just, just falls on, on, on deaf ears. You know, Biden began uh, in October of 23 saying, you know, Hamas has to be eradicated because they're so evil because they embed and hide behind civilians. Six months later, he's saying the war has to end for the very same reason, right? That 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 Hamas embeds and hides behind civilians. I mean, it shows you the it shows you the 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 absence of conviction. Just the the, the attempt to kind of put your finger in the air and see which way the wind is blowing, and, and head in that direction. And you know, people should people should you know should understand that there are civilian casualties in every war. But but the fact that America uh, even exists today is is a function of a war. In which you know many, many, many more of our opponents' civilians were killed. There were two million Nazi civilians, two million German civilians were killed in World War II. Right? There, there were almost no American civilians killed in World War II. The war wasn't on our soil, and there were only about a hundred thousand uh, British civilians killed in World War II. But there were two million Germans. Now, you know, on that theory, you know, we should all be speaking German right now. We should all be, we should have surrendered to Germany. We should have given them, you know, the keys to uh, to our country because they had the most civilian deaths. I mean, this is insanity. I mean, good armies protect their civilians. Moral people protect their civilians. People like Hamas, they, 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 they put their civilians in harm's way. That's not, that's not a moral failing of Israel. It's a moral failing of Hamas. Absolutely. And right now you have the Biden administration putting conditions on aid to Israel. I mean, Israel is supposed to be our closest ally. If we're now putting conditions on Israel, which I don't remember Israel putting conditions on us when we spent 20 years fighting back after September 11th, America's longest war, what does that say about our relationship with Israel right now and the threat, the imminent threat that I think we're going to be facing? Because this is not just an existential war in 
my belief and what Prime Minister Netanyahu has said um, against Israel, this is an existential threat to our nation as well. Well, look, all you had to do, all you had to, you know, hear that that guy in Michigan. Um, you know, if his following continues to grow and people start listening to him, we're all, we're all in, in, at a lot of risk here. I mean, this is this is somebody. You know, his rhetoric is something that will get people killed in America, not right. just there, not just around the world. And look, the the other thing, you know, Sarah, is that. Um, well, in the response to President Biden putting conditions on Israel, I mean, that well, that well, that's what's 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 so unfortunate about that is that Hamas considers that a victory. I mean, Hamas is celebrating right now. They're celebrating that they've created daylight between America and Israel. They're celebrating that they were able to uh, to get America to abstain from a UN Security Council resolution that. Um, directed Israel to stop fighting, but never, ever condemned Hamas for the atrocities it committed on October 7th. Why so, is that? Uh, Why is that? Why is Hamas rarely called out for that? The, because the UN is a, is a failed organization. I mean, I, 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 we had this, you know, I remember, you know, um, Nikki Haley gave it everything she had, you know, for two years, trying to just get one thing done. She was trying to get the Security Council to condemn Hamas, you know, they, Hamas had attacked Israel then as well, you know, attacked uh, Israeli civilians. And she was working it really hard and she was putting all the all the, the, the weight of America behind her, her pressure. And she thought there was a chance, couldn't get it done, couldn't get it done. And that was, you know, uh, under much less um, controversial circumstances than now. Um, you can't get it done. Look, look the UN, you know, we're, we're, we're paying, you know, 25 percent of the expenses of the UN. We're one country out of 195. I used to go there, you know, when uh, during uh, you know UN week, and I'd sit in that seat where you know, where the United States was for for part of the time, and I just I just was you know you know they 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 put the seats in alphabetical order. So I said, well, we're America. We should be up front. And they said, no, no, no. You're the United States of America. You're you're at you. You got you sit all the way in the back. So. You know, we sit all, all the way in the back. We pay all the expenses, and we get beaten up every time we show up there. And these uh, these um, you know autocrats, these dictators, these guys like Erdogan and Khamenei, um, these you know anti-Semitic, brutal dictators walk around there like they own the place, and we just pay the expenses. So I, I'm I'm as you might have gathered, I'm not a huge fan of the United Nations. Yeah, neither am I. Um, if President Trump should take the White House in November. Um, and when he steps in in January, do you think it what do you think should happen with the U.N.? Do you think he should go back to cutting the purse strings, like demanding more and yeah. cutting back? Yeah, I would say, look, we you know, you treat us like we're one country out of one hundred and ninety five. We'll pay one one hundred and ninety fifth of the expenses. And the rest of you guys that are just, you know, acting cowardly and immorally and against our interests and against the interests of the world, we're, you know, you know, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to think real hard about why we ought to be giving visas to terrorists to come in and uh, and insult us and attack America uh, on our home soil. I mean, normally we don't do that. And, you know, you know, if the United Nations is going to be in New York, then and, you know, uh, Khamenei wants to show up from Iran and give a speech. Let him do it by Zoom, you know, He'll let him do it by uh, some other some other way. I don't I don't need him on American soil. I totally agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And that's what makes it so insane. I mean, that we've even left our border wide open. I feel like this government, uh, the Biden administration has done that purposefully. And I don't know who's going to pay the price if we are targeted or if something happens in this country where we have a sleeper cell uh, target uh, civilians in this nation. And how are we going to answer the rest of the world when that happens, when we, our own government has left the border wide open? I wanted to ask you about the two state solution. The Biden administration continues to suggest this is the time to move forward on a two state solution. I don't agree at all. Absolutely not. I was in Israel uh, standing by Prime Minister Netanyahu's side with our group, the Latino Coalition for Israel, uh, you know, standing by Israel's side on this. Um, at this time, I don't believe there is any need for any kind of unilateral move towards a two state solution. They want the Palestinian Authority to run this new Palestinian state. This is supposedly the moderate Palestinian option but it still pays family members of terrorists killed or imprisoned 
for attacking Israel. What's your mm-hmm. assessment of the policy on this? Oh, I just think it's upside down. Look, um, 82% of the Palestinians living in Judea and Samaria in, in the West Bank, as others refer to it, 82% support what Hamas did on October 7th. Now, we're going we're gonna to give these people a, a state. We're going to give them independence. We're going to give them a platform so that they can attack Israel. Understand that, you know, as, as, as difficult as the Gaza uh, attack was, um, Gaza is not as close to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv as is the West Bank. So you're talking about putting a terrorist state, you know, smack dab in between Israel's, you know, Israel's population centers. That's number one. Number two, look, um, I'm still of the view that, you know, that the Bible matters. I'm still of the view that God matters. You know, the Bible sells like 2,000 copies an hour still. You know, I think there's still a lot of people in the world that care about the Bible. And if you care about the Bible, you care about having the opportunity to visit biblical Israel, all right? Now, this this two-state solution would create a Palestinian state in biblical Israel, in Hebron, in Bethlehem, in Shiloh, in Bethel, in, uh, in the eastern portion of Jerusalem, on the Mount of Olives. These are places that, you know, are important to, to billions of people. And, you know, people sometimes save up all their money just to go there once in their lives. And, and it has a profound effect to reconnect you know, to, to walk the same path that was walked by David or Jesus or Joshua or Moses. Well, not Moses. He didn't, you know, um, Moses, Moses never got across the Jordan River. But everybody else, you know, it's, it's deeply powerful. And um, that two-state solution, uh, apart from being a, an existential threat, probably a final solution to the Jewish people in Israel, it will also result in biblical Israel being out of reach. They'll destroy it. You know, right now, Joseph's tomb is in Area A. It's very hard to get to. It's almost impossible. They, 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 they've destroyed it, you know, and, and, and they have a history. You know, radical Islamists have a history of destroying um, all the ancient sites of uh, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus. Um, that's what's going to happen here. So um, it's never a good idea, but it's a particularly bad idea right now. I, I remember uh, just on the recent trip I was in Israel, we were able to stand on the top of uh, the mountain and kind of look over and see Joseph's tomb, but we could not access it. You can't access yeah. it, but like once a year um, at a certain time of the day. Uh, so they basically keep people from that. And it's, it is, it is very frightening to think of what can happen. I saw that in Afghanistan when uh, the Buddhist uh, statues were destroyed. Um, and, you know, I remember talking to people, Nancy Dupree, who was this wonderful lady who has since passed away. And she said she had begged and begged and begged the Taliban to please, you know, save those statues. And they did not. And that's exactly what would happen to Israel in Hebron and in other places if we did have this two state solution. Let me ask you this. What would be your warning to the United States? Because I truly believe that Israel serves as an example for us and that Israel's security is our security. And that if we turn our back on the state of Israel, we are literally turning our back on our own security and our own place in the world. Do you see it that way? And if not, why? And if so, why? Well, I see it that way. And and I, and I, I, I can speak to it, you know, from personal knowledge. I mean, I can't get into specifics, but when I was ambassador, you know, um, you know, part of my job was to work with the uh, work with the CIA and work with the Mossad and work with the other security agencies to identify threats to to the homeland, threats to America that were originating in the Middle East. And in some respects, Israel has better eyes on those threats than than Americans do just because they're there and they have the the uh, the, the equipment and the know how and the relationships to, to get really, really good intel. Uh, I can tell you, um, as a matter of fact, that um, there are Americans in the homeland on, on American soil who are safe today, uh, who are alive today because of threats that were that were thwarted because of Israel's cooperation with America. That relationship is incredibly important um, to American safety. It's, it's, it's reciprocal. I mean, it works both ways. But, um, you know, it really is important for America have, to have this reciprocal cooperative relationship 
you know, with Israel. And um, and look, I mean, how many times do we have to get kicked in the head by radical Islamists? I mean, it's not like we haven't seen this movie before. Right. And um, and they're coming again. I mean, they you know, look, we you know. Are you it's, worried it's, about our border ambassador? Are you worried about the wide open border? I know when I was in Guatemala and I was talking to defense officials in Guatemala last year, one of the big warnings that they had, and they talked about their cooperation, and this was before the new government took hold, which is now more toward the left. But when I was there during President Jamate, and even before that with Jimmy Morales, one of the big uh, I think incredible relationships that we had with them was that we would work with them and Israel was working hand in hand with Guatemala, attempting to thwart exactly what you said were threats heading our way, mitigating those threats that could possibly be in Central America, people that were going to access our border or try to enter the United States. Um, sure. Well, think of it like this, right? After 9-11, right, we, we created the Department of Homeland Security and we created as part of that the the TSA, right? So now you know you want to get on an airplane, you got to go through the TSA, whatever it's worth. I'm not I'm not an expert. I don't I'm, I'm not terribly impressed, but whatever it is, you go through the TSA, and that's supposed to keep us safe. So at airports, you know everybody's being checked and everybody's being vetted, and uh, and and that's great. And air traffic seems to be relatively safe. Um, all those people who who are supposed to be stopped at the TSA checkpoints are able to just go through Mexico and there's no checkpoints at all, right? And you have this flood of people, and um, and we're basically telling them, you know, you know, don't don't fly into America, just walk into America, and um, and we got all these gotaways, we got all the, we have we have no idea, you know, who we've missed, so we have, um, I think, what what anybody would consider to be a totally unacceptable. Uh, security situation right now. The head of the FBI has admitted that the the head of uh, Homeland Security is completely incompetent, and um, uh, of course I worry. I mean, I've got you know anybody anybody who's living in this country with kids and family who you know if we think you know I, I I hope I never I hope we don't have to ever do a show looking back on on a, on a terror attack. But y y you'd have to be a wild eyed optimist right now to think that we're not in danger. I put it this way, from one to 10, one being we're at the safest point in our nation's history to 10, where do you think we're at? Uh, we're pretty close to 10. Yeah, we're pretty close to the worst. I mean, just because the it's, it's, it's impossible based upon the volume of people that have passed our border who've gotten away that there aren't a few of them that want to kill us. And whether, whether they have the means, whether they have the opportunity, whether somehow they can be uh, interdicted now through you know, through wiretapping or other, you know, means, I mean, but they're in our country, they want to hurt us. And now it's a whole lot harder to stop them now that they're inside the country. Yeah, it's terrifying to think so. I only have a few more questions for you. Sorry, and I've taken a lot of your time, but I just, I, I think it's so important for the audience to hear what you have to say, because you truly understand the region, um, unlike anyone else. Um, you know, as you look ahead uh, at the tr possible Trump administration, a second Trump administration, um, what does the president need to do first to repair the damage done? And that's been done by the Biden administration. And are you looking to participate in a future ad President Trump administration, which I, I think you absolutely should? That's my opinion. <laughs> I have a few ideas. How about State Department? Oy, what a swamp that is. I mean, uh yeah, it's uh, <laughs> that's that's about one of the most dysfunctional places in our government. Um, look, I think um, I, I, I believe President Trump, the first thing he'll do is close the border. Um, I think the second thing he'll do is um, is to um, make sure that our homeland is is safe and that it is being and that people who are looking after our safety are more concerned about stopping criminals than making sure people use the right pronouns when they speak to each other. And, uh, and I think that's going to have a, I think hopefully he'll, he'll take that same approach with our department of, uh, defense. Um, I think that's number one. Th th then, then I, I mean, I think there's a lot he can do to, uh, bring down inflation. I think he's going to, um, obviously, uh, advance our, uh, you know, domestic production of energy, which I think is, is crucial to jumpstarting our economy. He knows what to do. I mean, he did those things before. What, what I really like about, about President Trump this time around 
is there's no learning curve. And, and the reality is, you know, as, as talented as you are, you don't go from, um, from, you know, no political experience to running the country without a learning curve and without having a lot of people telling you what they think you ought to do. And a lot of those people don't really have America's best interest at heart. This time around, I think he's he's got this figured out. I don't think I think he can really be extremely effective on day one. I don't think we're going to have you know uh, all these uh, these uh, you know slowdowns with you know with the Russia uh, hoax and, and 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 other things. I think he'll get the right people the first time that want to support America and support his agenda. And um, and look, you know, uh, I appreciate your uh, your vote of confidence. It's his call, not yours, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> what 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 job I get? And um, yeah, I hope he gets me a good job. I mean, I'm I'm ready to I'm ready to help. I I think we I think we get along really well. I think he um, respects me. I think I did a I did well by him uh, the first four years. And and if you if he wants me back uh, in some capacity that makes sense for the country. Um, I'm, I'm going to be really excited to help him. That's fantastic. Well, I don't even, I, I wanted to ask you one more. I wanted to see if the, but I love the way you just ended that, but I am going to ask it anyways. Um, <laughs> can moderate liberals like, you know, John Fetterman and others, do you think that there's any way to save the democratic party right now? Or do you think the democratic party is just so far to the left that there's, that there's just no way it's ever going to get back to where it was? You know, it, 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 I think that I think I think political parties reflect the um, the citizenship, the, the population of their supporters. You know, in democracies, they're just mirrors into what people want. That's what their job is. So, so every now and then, you get somebody who's really principled. And, and, and oddly enough, it certainly came as a great surprise to me, John Fetterman. Uh, wow, um, I mean, because his <laughs> me constituency is n not happy with him, right? They're not happy with what he's doing, but he's taking a principled stand, and God bless him. You know, um, we got a few more like that, like Richie Torres, and and you know, in the Bronx, same thing. You know, he's it's not necessarily what his people want, but he's taking a position of principle. But there's not a lot of principle left in in the Democratic Party when when the um, when a guy who has held himself out for years as the great defender of Israel who's now the Senate majority leader, gets up and, and puts in the same in the same sentence, says that the problems in the Middle East are attributable to Hamas and Netanyahu. That's a, that's one of the worst things I've ever heard anybody say, let alone somebody who's Jewish, let alone somebody who claims to be a protector of the Jewish people. So I think the problem is that um, Democrats generally are, um, are, are losing their way. Um, I think college campuses have lost their way, and that has caused... A lot of uh, a lot of very misguided people, and that misguided uh, approach is reflective in, in who they elect. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I think you know more than ever, um, this country needs Republican leadership really more than ever. Yeah, absolutely. I think if this country does not get strong Republican leadership uh, back in office in November, I'm afraid that we are faced with a peril that we have not seen uh, in this country ever, not just in modern political history, but I think throughout the history of this nation. And that is pretty terrifying. Thank you so much, Ambassador Friedman, for being on the Sarah Carter Show. I hope you come back. And I pray that you come back as someone serving President Trump and a future administration. We really, really need you. Thank you so much. Loved doing this show. Uh, great questions and a great conversation. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Ambassador Friedman. I feel like I've learned so much from you today, and I welcome you back on The Sarah Carter Show. Folks, please make sure you're subscribed to The Sarah Carter Show on your favorite podcast app. It really helps us keep the show free and gives us a boost in our algorithm. If you're watching on Rumble or YouTube, just give us a like and follow as well. Thank you. Follow me on Truth at Sarah Carter Official, on X at Sarah Carter DC, and on Instagram at S Carter DC. God bless you. God bless our nation and God bless the great state of Texas.